beyond that, those neuronal connections are sort of what they call mushroom shaped, which means that you get really increased long-term memory. And so it's one of the most exciting products on the list. You're listening to the Ethos Athletes Podcast, where we believe that your health is the number one resource you need to accomplish your dreams. My name is Dr. Matthew Hernandez, and I'm a physician dedicated to helping my patients maintain their active lifestyle and continue doing what they love. I'm sitting down with other experts so that we can provide our listeners with the knowledge they need to improve their health and live their best life. Hey, everyone. This is Dr. Matthew Hernandez, and you're listening to the Ethos Athletes Podcast. Today, we're going to be continuing our peptide series, and we're going to be talking about peptides that help with cognitive function. Uh, so helping you think more clear, be sharper uh, with, with your thinking, all those things. And so uh, for this episode, just like the rest of the peptide series, we have Ryan Smith, who is the founder of TaylorMade Compounding, which is uh, one of the biggest peptide compounding pharmacies here in the U.S. Ryan, thank you for joining us again today. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Uh, thanks again. I look forward to uh, talking about some of these things and some of the things we missed maybe on, on the last uh, podcast. Oh, as yeah. Well. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, definitely love that. So Again, today we're going to be talking about uh, peptides that help with cognitive function. Uh, this is something that a lot of the patients that we've seen here in our office are very interested in. A lot of people are uh, either business owners or um, you know their, their job requires them to be very mentally sharp. And so they're looking for ways to help with that outside of taking like Adderall, Ritalin, you know, different things like that. Uh, obviously, that, that's not something that, that they want to do. And so um, you know, that they're, they're saying, what, what can I do to help? Um, you know, think sharper, essentially. Uh, so let's get into these. And the, I think the very first one we were going to talk about was was one that we've mentioned in the past, which is uh, cerebrolysin. Um, now, I've used this particular peptide uh, for helping with uh, healing nerve damage, uh, but you know, we, we can also use it for cognitive function. So Ryan, let's talk a little bit about that. Yeah, absolutely. The cerebrolysin, I think we've talked about now a couple times with TBI. Um, I think we talked about it with some of the uh, neuropathies that we were talking about. But um, a lot of people still like it just as a general um, maintenance dose uh, for cognitive function. Uh, it Just as a recap, it's it's a sort of a, a drug that's made of porcine brain matter. So it's a bunch of different nerve growth factors like IGF-1, IGF-2, a uh, bunch of you know, brain-derived nootropic bacteria, a lot of those things which have a lot of different etiologies. Um, but together what they do is they help protect neurons and, and different neural cell tissues. And so um, people, sometimes people who have an APOE4 variant, which predisposes them to Alzheimer's, will do this um, on a maintenance dose so a couple of times a year. I'm one of them. Um, and what you can get is some people report pretty positive effects as it relates to memory, um, you know, and I would say mainly memory, but also just focus and alertness. That's awesome. Um, is, is cerebrolysin something that, that a lot of doctors are using for this purpose or is it, is, is it primarily sticking with like the TBI and the nerve damage, stuff like that? Sure. Yeah, no, I think that uh, the demand for this is high in just about every area, but pr particularly for anyone who wants to be proactive about their mental health, right? Um, you know, although it, it's great, it has great studies in Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, uh, and some of these, you know, regrowing myelin and MS patients, for instance, most people are looking at it not as a treatment, but as a uh, preventative strategy to maintain consistent and, and optimal neurological processing uh, throughout a lifetime. So I would say the majority of the physicians who are using it with us are doing it uh, just preventatively. Okay. As we talked about cerebrolysin in the past, pretty safe. There's really nothing that we need yeah. to worry about with this particular peptide. Yeah, har hardly any adverse uh, events. The really the one the, is that if you have a risk of seizure, not to use it because it can right. um, can can I guess cause some stimulation. That's really the only adverse event that's been described in most of the clinical literature. Okay, let's jump on to uh, the next peptide, which is dihexa. This is this is one that you talked about uh, specifically for cognitive function, correct? Yeah, absolutely. The dihexa is incredibly exciting. Uh, probably one of the most exciting products that we have just because of its ability to affect so many different disease states. Um, and what it does is it, it, uh, it mimics the hepatocyte growth factor um, to, uh, to activate CMET. So it acts like an angiotensin IV derivative. Uh, all of which means you just get increased neurological stimulation. And so some of the results that it's had in terms of Parkinson's uh, type disease modeled states, Alzheimer's, really any uh, type of cognitive dysfunction has been extremely positive. But a lot of people like it, like I said, just like the cerebral and beyond disease states and just for optimal function. 
Okay. Is it, uh, so a lot of people are using this preventatively as well, as opposed to actual treatment for something. Yeah, just because it's it's still relatively so new, I would say it's not to the preventative degree like the cerebralizin. Um, many people are just targeting uh, really hard to treat uh, neurodegenerative diseases. And so that tends to be, I would say, the, the bulk of it now for most of our physicians. But, uh, you know, it, it still has, uh, I would say, a lot of people who use it for, for the cognitive benefits by itself. Okay. Hey, is there any studies that show or any research that's been done on uh, dihexa and uh, someone who's starting to develop dementia or different things like that? Um, so it, it to date doesn't have any published human clinical research. Yeah. But with that being said, it has um, some amazing animal trials, particularly in dementia, particularly in Alzheimer's. Uh, I always recommend a really unique video to watch. Uh, if, if you search for dihexa and, and Dr. Harding on uh, Vimeo, you can see a really amazing video of a, of a rat doing a hanging test uh, after a Parkinson's-induced treatment, um, which is absolutely incredible. You see uh, essentially the, the value that it can have to treat Parkinson's models, um, and I would recommend everyone take a look at that. Okay. We'll definitely put that in the, in the show notes. Can you repeat it one more time what, what the video yeah. is? So if you just uh, search uh, Dr. Harding, uh, Dihexa, D-I-H-E-X-A, on Vimeo, there will be a video that comes up, and it's him talking about a lot of the origins of the, the medication and sort of how it came to be, um, its path through pharma and its development. But toward the end, he shows some results, some of the increased synaptic, synaptic you know, uh, I guess, uh, connections in the brain uh, via some histology slides, um, and but particularly that it shows a, a Parkinson's-treated mouse, uh, sorry, rat, who um, had a re- incredible response with a dihexa. Um, and you can sort of see that happening in, in a physical setting. And so I highly recommend that. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Um, is there anything else with dihexa that, that you can think to? Yeah. So yeah, the, beyond that, I mean, the dihexa is um, just, it, it's got so much utility. It's got essentially 10 million times the potency of BDNF, which is one of those, you know, nerve factors we talk about with things like cerebralis. And so it is extremely, extremely potent. And the one big thing about it too, is it's a worldly bioavailable, uh, which gives it um, some benefit as well. And so definitely just something to, uh, to consider if you, if you have family with neurological conditions uh, that are sort of losing some options. Okay. No, that's awesome. And then what about, I think the last peptide that you had met or that we had talked about um, in the, before the show started was, is it FGLL? Yeah, correct. That one is, is um, a great for neurological performance. And I actually want to jump in here and say, for those who listened to the last podcast about uh, you know, anxiety and depression, there's one product we, we forgot to mention was the aniracetam. I uh, definitely wanted to bring that up as well because it is uh, another product with some... Uh, with some cognitive uh, benefits, some short-term cognitive benefits in terms of processing speeds um, and has an anti-anxiety benefit. So I wanted to tie that back in as well. But yeah. in terms of the FGLL, that is also one of the most exciting products on the list. Um, it is made to mimic a fibroblast growth factor activator. Um, and it, it's based off a neural cell adhesion molecule. And so it's been studied to help with you know, stroke, depression, um, the whole nine yards. But the biggest thing that it's, it's shown to help with is Alzheimer's and memory, particularly memory in healthy older individuals who are sort of having um, some memory deficits or some, you know, not even dementia, but just maybe some cognitive uh, cloud, right? Um, and so it, it has been incredibly exciting. It had a, uh, 2011, it was awarded $60 million for further research. Um, and it has a phase one clinical trial, which shows it's completely safe and had really no adverse events. Um, but it works by activating the fibroblast growth factor receptor and encouraging dendrite outgrowth. And so you're creating new neuronal connections. Um, And beyond that, those neuronal connections are sort of what they call mushroom shaped, which means that you get really increased long-term memory. And so it's one of the most exciting products on the list um, and so relatively new. Okay. That's that's really good. Um, For for this particular product and then for also for Dihexa, is, is there a lot of clinical use that, you know, are, are doctors still adopting the use of this particular peptide? Absolutely. They're both very, very new. And so there's a lot of training now going on um, on these, these products. But I should say that the, uh, in particular, the FGLL has a great safety profile. It's just very, very expensive. And so uh, finding clinically relevant doses that are still affordable is, is sort of the battle now. Okay. Um, people trying to, to see what is actually um, the lowest dose, which actually exerts a positive effect so they can keep the price low for their patients um, and, and still have uh, some really good efficacy. Okay. 
and you, and then uh, let's go back to the other one that you had mentioned. We skipped in the previous podcast. Tell me a little bit more about that one. The Aniracetam. Yeah, so the Aniracetam um, is is one that is definitely used for for increasing uh, cognitive function. It's part of a family of racetams. Um, you know, the most common of which is probably the Puracetam. Uh, which is approved in a lot of countries. And, and those work, uh, the mechanism of action for those is still a little bit unknown, uh, but they, we know they have some cholinergic effect as well as modulating the AMPA receptors. And so most of the studies on these show increased processing speeds, especially in, 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 in better memory in short terms. And so um, the aniracetam, the reason we should, probably should have mentioned on the last podcast is because like this like C-Link, it also has sort of a, an anti-anxiety benefit that's sort of different from a lot of the other racetams. And so it's... Uh, it is uh, an exciting one, but uh, one that's really used in short-term processing. So, you know, before a particularly stressful event or a test or something like that, people will use the aniracetam. Okay. So, so when, when you're comparing uh, aniracetam to c when and, and the anti-anxiety component to it, you want to be able to use aniracetam for something like performance anxiety compared to someone that has like, everyday anxiety, correct? Absolutely, and um, and people usually stay away from the really chronic dosing of those those uh, racetam derivatives because I guess the mechanism of action is still a little bit uncertain, and so uh, more event based rather than the chronic uh, type things you would do with C-Link. Okay, now again, uh, just like in the last podcast, we talked about where you can have a desensitization of the receptors that these peptides affect if you take too much of them. Uh, is that the case with the ones that we've discussed today? Yeah, so not really. Almost all of them, we haven't seen any signs of that, with the exception of the aniracetam, which uh, might sort of develop that. And again, another reason to use it more on a, a, a specific uh, event basis instead of the chronic usage. Okay, awesome. Let's see, I have one more question. With any of these particular cognitive peptides, so the results that you can expect, if you could just kind of recap on those, on those results uh, with yeah, so, what people yeah. experience. Yeah, definitely. So if you're looking for more of that short-term benefit, more of that short-term boost, you know, I, most of our positions would tend to lean toward the aniracetam, the C-Link, the C-Max, um, with those being prioritized. A lot of people now are thinking about FGL in that as well. Um, but like I said, the dosing is still being worked out to make it affordable. And so those four, I would say, are more for the short-term, whereas the long-term type benefit are going to be things like the cerebralisin, um, you know, the dihexa, the FGLL. Those are going to be ones which might have some short-term benefit, but also uh, used more preventatively uh, to maintain normal and healthy brain function throughout life. Awesome. Perfect. Well, Ryan, thank you again for uh, being on the uh, part of the peptide series for this podcast and for sharing your knowledge with uh, all the peptides that we've discussed. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for having me. And uh, hopefully as uh, we continue to have some more developments, we'll be back on. Yeah, absolutely. We'll, we'll probably do uh, maybe like a quarterly update or something like that. We can discuss more on those. Sounds good. Uh, Awesome. Well, everyone, I think we threw enough information at you today. Uh, so again, just to recap, we talked about peptides for cognitive function uh, and helping you uh, be more mentally sharp. If you have any further questions on this, feel free to reach out to us uh, at the email address, hello at ethosathletespodcast.com. Uh, and we'll be happy to answer any questions that you have. Or obviously, if you have any um, ideas for episodes, different things like that, if, you want, if you'd like to learn more about a particular topic, let me know and, and we can make that happen. Uh, so again, thank you for listening and I hope everyone has a great day.